Well, good morning. How are we doing today? Good. That was kind of good, I think, actually. A little concerning, but that's all right. You glad to be at church today? Amen. Well, I'm glad that you're here as well. If I haven't met, my name is Chris. I have the honor of serving as a senior pastor here at BT and the privilege of taking us into God's word today. If you have a copy of the scriptures, digital or physical, why don't you take that out and meet me in the book of Genesis chapter 12. As you turn there, we say that each week. If you have a copy, maybe on your phone, your iPad, or a physical copy, uh, I realize every week we have the verses on the screen, and we're going to continue to do that. But understand, this is the textbook, and I encourage you to bring the textbook with you to class, if you will. Uh, so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 12, and uh, before we jump in <coughs> here at BT, we believe in celebrating what God has been up to. And so what that means for our church uh, this year, uh, this is the first Sunday of May, and so uh, through basically four months of this year, we've celebrated 250 three people saying yes to Jesus, trusting him as Savior and Lord of their lives, and 153 people being obedient believers baptism, entering the baptistries of our campuses, being baptized in prisons, and uh, we're just so thankful for what God is doing and believe uh, that he is not done working in us and through us just yet. Uh, Today, we're going to continue on in our sermon series entitled The Story, and What we're doing, if you're new today, is we're journeying from Genesis, first book of the Bible, to Revelation, last book of the Bible. We're going to do it in five months. We're obviously not going to look at every uh, chapter, every verse of every book. We're going to look at major themes. And so what we're doing is looking at six major themes to be exact. We start off looking at the creation account that God spoke everything into existence, that it was perfect and good, and that he made humanity as the crown of his creation. Adam and Eve lived in perfect fellowship with God, and then one day they were tempted by the serpent, Satan. They bought into the temptation, they rebelled against God, and chaos entered the scene. We've been experiencing the brokenness of that result ever since then. But we know that when chaos entered the scene, God planned to fix things, because we couldn't do it on our own. God began to reveal that he was going to correct the course. He did so in Genesis 3 when humanity sinned, first off by calling them to himself when he asked the man, where are you? But then specifically as he spoke of the effects of the fall, he would say to the serpent, that is Satan, that one day the offspring of the woman would crush his head. And that was a picture of the coming of Jesus who would once and for all defeat sin and death for all those who would place their faith in him. And so there's the creation account, there's chaos that enters the scene. And then now where we are is we're in the chapter of the story called covenants. You see, a covenant is an arrangement, a relationship that God makes with his people to reveal that he's gonna reconcile things to himself. It's not a contract, right? We've said that before. We're thankful it's not a contract. When someone signs a contract, when I sign a contract, I sign a contract making sure that the literature, the data is to my best interest. Contracts that I sign, I want to make sure are good for me. But God sets up covenants because through his covenants, he intends to bring people back to himself. And so we saw that as uh, things progressed. We looked last week that things kind of went from bad to worse, so bad that God had said he regretted creating the world. And then Uh, Though he spared Noah and his family, a few chapters later in Genesis chapter 11, people once again uh, were corrupt. They thought we're going to make a name for ourselves there at the Tower of Babel. But God continued to be gracious. He raised up Noah as a measure of grace to continue his creation. He scattered the people there at Babel so that they wouldn't kill each other. But today, as we get to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to begin to really dive into the covenants that God establishes. What we're going to talk about today as we look at a man named Abram, he would end up having his name changed to Abraham. You may not be familiar with Abram, but you may be familiar with Abraham. Uh, Some of you maybe grew up in church, you know that sometimes we call him not just Abraham, but we call him Father Abraham because he had many sons. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know, but but I'm one of them. So are you? We should probably just... Praise the Lord. We have some guests today for the first time that are questioning if they've walked into a cult. And uh, (laughs) of course we're not a cult. Father Abraham. 
What we're going to look at specifically is how God blessed Abraham or Abram, but how that blessing wasn't actually meant to terminate upon itself, but that the blessing was meant to be carried forward. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. Just for the record, every person here in the room or in overflow or watching online, every person on the planet actually is blessed today. Those of us that have said yes to Jesus, we're walking in the fullness of blessing because of that relationship, but every person is actually blessed. You say, well, Chris, how do you know that every person is blessed? Well, here we go. Let's do an experiment together. On the count of three, take a deep breath. Here we go. One, two, three. And make sure you exhale or that'll be bad for you, right? You realize that you did nothing to, to create your life. You do nothing to sustain your life. I mean, you, you may be trying to diet well and exercise, and that is a good thing to do, but, but actually your life is sustained by the very blessing of God. So every person who is breathing has a blessing from God. Every person who has said yes to Jesus is walking. They may not always be aware of it, but they're walking in the fullness of blessing. Now, while we are blessed, the question could be, why are we blessed, right? Well, I think what the Bible teaches us is we are blessed so that yes, as we glorify God, we also experience fullness of life, but we're also blessed so that we can point other people to the source of blessing. Now, here's the reality. While we can agree that we're blessed, we can also agree that every morning we wake up and we see the world is broken, right? I mean, if you're unsure, turn on the news. Wars and protests and children being abandoned and You can look across the street, you can look across the world. Brokenness is evident. You see, the brokenness that we see around us, the brokenness that we experience is a result of the curse that came about because humanity chose sin. And I don't know about you, but but some days I wake up and and, and I feel that that day I, I see the curse more than I see the blessing. Some days the curse seems more prevalent. But I want you to know, beloved, is that the days we feel that way, that's exactly what Satan wants us to feel. He wants us to believe that all is lost. He wants us to believe that the curse reigns supreme. And what I want you to know is that God, through those who have said yes to Jesus, he has called us according to his purpose to actually reverse the curse. He's called us to be a people of blessing that bless others. He's called us by his grace to reverse the curse. And so my question that I want to kind of set the stage with is what are we projecting? When we go through our lives, go through our days, and when some days seem more broken than blessed, what do we project? Do we project the curse or the blessing? When we face the seemingly never-ending irritations that each of us have, right? They're not all the same, but we each have them. Those things that seem so small, but yet they can just frustrate us in a moment. Bad service, kids not listening, whatever it may be. And just to be clear, those things shouldn't be, but when those things happen in our days, do we project the curse and respond accordingly, or do we project the blessing? How, how can we, on days that seem like the curse is, is what is most supreme, how can we continue to know that we're blessed, and how can we continue to be a blessing? How do we live a life that reflects that the blessing rules our heart, not the curse? So what I want to do is I want to look at Genesis chapter 12, and then we're going to turn over to Genesis chapter 15, and what I want us to do is look at the call of Abram and see if we can't learn how we can continue to live a blessed life seeking to bless others. So what it says, this is what it says in Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse one. It says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. The first thing I want you to understand when it comes to living a life of blessing that seeks to be a blessing, how can we do that? The first thing is this, we've got to make sure we're on the right path. You gotta make sure we're on the right path. What, what I think is interesting is that the, the story of the famous Father Abraham, who we sing songs about, who the Bible speaks of 
quite a bit, it doesn't actually begin with Abraham in and of himself being this awesome guy. It begins not with Abram seeking God, but verse 1 of Genesis 12, then the Lord said to Abram. The Lord sought him out. And in speaking, the Lord said, go from your home, go from your land, go from your relatives, go from your father's house, and go exactly to this place, right? That's not, yeah. he, he didn't say go to this place. He said, go to the place that I'll show you. I, I know many times in my life when I wrestle with God, it, it's because he is calling me to do something or to go somewhere, but he has not yet given me the final destination. And I'm just like, Lord, if you'll just tell me exactly where I'm going, I would have left yesterday. But I just need a little more information, right? But God says to Abram, go from what you know, go from the unfaithful, familiar, and be faithful to me and make me what you're familiar with. Go to the place that I will show you. You Now, what's interesting is that he didn't make a suggestion here. He didn't say, Abram, if you don't have anything going on later on, if you, if you find room in your schedule, I think it would be great. It'd be really neat if you just kind of left everything and, 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 and just started going somewhere. Well, where would you like me to go? Well, don't worry about that. We'll get to that. If, if you're okay with it. You know, beloved, what I think many times is when we find ourselves wrestling with God, when we find ourselves sometimes wanting to shake our fist and say, God, I don't know what you're up to, but my life is a wreck and I don't hear your voice and I don't see your hand and I don't think you're holding up your end of the bargain. I think sometimes if we're honest, what we can do is trace our actions and, and many times what we'll find is we've turned his commands into suggestions. There's a path that God had for Abram. There wasn't multiple options. There was a path. The path was to his presence. And God wasn't speaking with suggestive tones. This is a command. He says, go, leave, and I will show you the way. This is what I believe, beloved. Every time God God calls us to go somewhere, he is calling us to leave something behind. He's calling us to trust him. He's calling us to do something. He's calling us to act. And in the calling, many times, if not all the time, he is calling us to leave something behind. He does not, in verse one, define the destination because what I believe is the path that God wants to call us on, the path of blessing by which we can bless others, is not simply about a destination, it's about his presence. You see, what would happen in the life of Abraham is the God of creation would become the God of Abraham. In in the uh, 1920s and the 1930s, the ancient Mesopotamian city of Ur was excavated. If you want to nerd out and Google it, Sir Leonard Woolley is who you would want to Google. Sir Leonard Woolley led the excavation of the ancient city of of Ur, that's where Abram would be from. And as they excavated the city and they studied all the artifacts, what they found was based on what they could deduce from this historical site, this this amazing finding, what they could deduce is that the people in the land of Ur largely had no knowledge of the one true God. Now that would make sense because again, After the flood, Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, as the waters subside and God would tell Noah and his descendants to go, to to spread out, to fill the earth, but when you get to chapter 11 of Genesis, they're trying to build cities and they're trying to, in Genesis chapter 11, make a name for themselves. They're trying to make a name for themselves. And so when you just look at the trajectory, 10 generations from Noah to Abram, what people have done in those generations is they have gone back 
to worshiping that which they choose to worship, not the one true God. And so it shouldn't be surprising that when Ur was discovered and excavated, the evidence pointed to a complete lack of awareness of the one true God. Where are you going with this, Chris? I believe it is completely within the realm of likelihood that Abram, prior to Genesis 12, had no knowledge of the one true God. I've said that before, and I actually had some people frustrated with that statement because we shouldn't say those things about Abram. Listen, it doesn't matter what Abram did before God called. It matters what he did when God called. The reason why I point this out is this. Some of us, we're believing the lie that we can't ever get on the right path. That our past is too checkered. That we're too far gone. But when God calls us, he's got a path to his presence and it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It matters what you do in the moment. We don't know what Abram had done. There's some historical evidence that says he probably had no awareness of the one true God and probably possibly even worshiped pagan idols. But God spoke, God called him, and he called him on purpose to a path. He called him to leave something behind so he could go to what God, to what God would have for him. But what I want you to know is that when God calls us on the path that leads to his presence, this is how his blessing always is with us because the path to his presence always opens our eyes to number two, his promise. His promise. Verses two and three of Genesis chapter 12, God says this, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God calls Abram, says, leave what you know. And as you do so, if you respond, this is what's going to happen. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you five times. God says, I will do this. I think what's interesting, beloved, is that what we see in the promise from God to Abram is that it is divinely initiated. Again, God sought out Abram, and now God is saying, I am going to do this. I'm going to bless you. I think it's interesting, it says, I will make your name great, when just a chapter before, it says people were trying to make a name for themselves. When we try to do what God wants to do for us on our own terms, it never works out, does it? It says, I'm going to bless you, make you into a great nation. I will bless you specifically. I will bless your name. And through your blessing, all the world is going to be blessed. I will, I will, I will, I will. It's the promise of God to be our provider. Now, I think what we need to understand is that the promise that is being made to Abram, the promise of his blessing is a personal promise because it's coming from a personal God. You know, one of the great roadblocks between our faith and the faith of Islam, those who follow Islam today, one of the great roadblocks is that the people who follow Islam cannot comprehend God to be a personal God. Because of who he is, Allah, as they would refer to God. He he is not personal, but he is detached. But what we see in the scriptures, Old and New Testament, is that God is a personal God making personal promises. He says to Abram, I'm going to bless you. We live in a world where lots of preachers are abusing the Bible and making it say, hey, if you just kind of trust God and if you really send, some, send me some money, then you're going to have lots of money yourselves. And that's not accurate. But what happens sometimes is, is the church knee jerk reacts the other way and we don't ever acknowledge that God does intend to bless his people. The promise of God to Abram, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be the father of a great nation. Abram and Sarai, Abraham and Sarah were barren. They hadn't had kids. They were well past that point. Many of you know the story. They would be blessed with Isaac. Isaac would have Jacob. Jacob would then father many kids. There would be the 12 tribes. It would become the nation of Israel that, that, that today there are people still descended from this lineage on the earth. It's a personal blessing. God would say to 
Abraham and Sarah later in Genesis chapter 17, he would say to Abraham that kings would come from his line. He would say to Sarah that she would be the mother of great kings. A thousand years after that, a guy named David would assume the throne of Israel. And if you keep following the trajectory from the same lineage, would not come someone who would sit on the throne here on earth, but he would sit on the throne that is above every throne because he's a king above every king and he's got a name above every name. It would be Jesus himself. The one who's at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a promise of God. He's making a personal promise. But remember, what we're talking about is is how do we continue not just to have eyes that recognize the blessing instead of the curse, but how do we live a blessed life to bless others? Notice this, that the personal blessing to Abram was not going to stay contained to him personally because the last part of verse three, God would say that it would be through Abram that the whole world would be blessed. Again, as the descendants of Abram or Abraham become the nation of Israel by God's choosing. But if you read the whole Old Testament, what you find is that time and time again, the the relationship of Israel and God is kind of up and down. They, they, They chase after some other idols. There's some good kings and there's some bad kings. And it's just kind of a rocky road road, right? And they, 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 were, they were called by God to reflect his goodness and grace. But ultimately what happens is that Jesus shows up. And it's the fact that Jesus came from the lineage of Father Abraham, that he came and he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross and he rose from the dead so that today the personal blessing of Abraham becomes the global blessing of everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus. Abram was blessed, yes, but he was blessed to be a blessing. And if you're not sure how, that, how that's working out, if you've called upon Jesus, you're evidence of it. There is the promise of God that is personal but also the promise that calls us to be a blessing to others. That's why Paul says this, but Paul would write this to the church at Galatia. In Galatians chapter three, verses eight and nine, Paul says, now the scriptures, now the scriptures saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles. If you don't speak churchese, if you're not Jewish in descent, you're a Gentile, all right? Now, The scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and proclaim the gospel ahead of time to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed through you. Consequently, those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. When God gives us his blessing his presence and his promise, he's doing so so that we can reflect that to others who are in need of that awareness of who Jesus is and what he does. I think it's interesting, just if you wanna nerd out for a second, that when the word nation is used in Genesis chapter 12, it is the word in Hebrew that is often used to refer not to just singular, but actually multiple nations of people, evident that God would call Abram and give him the blessing of descendants and would rise up a nation for his purpose. And it would be through that nation that today there are people of nations that have received the blessing and the promise of God. So, so how do we live a blessed life as a blessing? We recognize that God has called us to a specific path, a path that is about his presence. We recognize that there is a promise that God has for us, right? When he's calling us to something, his promise goes with us. But then there's a critical moment between verse three and verse four. And that is this, that when God reveals the path and the promise, he then invites us to participate. There is the role of our participation, Because while God issued a command to Abram, I believe in God's sovereignty that he has given us the ability, the freedom to respond to that command. And so verse four, Mike could have, it could have said, and Abram said, no, I'm good. (laughs) But instead we see this of Abram's participation in Genesis 12 verse four. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And so Abram said, well, that sounds great, God. Let me talk with my friends. Hey, that, that's a pretty enticing offer. Let me think it over. It says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. 
He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the side of Shechem at the Oak of Moray. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. By the way, further evidence of both the personal and global promise. Don't don't you love that? He didn't say to Abram, hey, I'm gonna make sure that before you die, you get this. He said, it'll be your offspring that'll see the fullness of this promise. To your offspring, I will give this land. So, So Abram, it says in the text, so Abram said, oh, but I want it now. So he built an altar. He built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Verse eight, from there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. He built an altar to the Lord there and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev. God speaks, he initiates. He says to Abram, I want you to leave what you know. I want you to go to where I'll show you. And in doing so, I'm going to bless you. I'm gonna bless your descendants. I'm gonna bless the whole world. The path and the promise have been spoken. But now it's Abraham's or Abram's participation. The Bible says this in other places that Abram or Abraham believed the Lord and it was credit to him as righteousness. What does that mean? He believed, it means he trusted that when God spoke, it didn't matter what Abram had trusted in or turned to before. When God spoke, he trusted what God said. And that belief, God says, I want you to leave what you know. I'm going to bless you in this way. Abraham trusted, Abram trusted God, but what did he do? He went. Verse four doesn't say, and Abram believed God, but stayed there because he he had a pretty good life. He stayed because it was familiar. He stayed because it was comfortable. It says he believed, he went. It says, and Abram went. You know, I think one of the great challenges that face the church, particularly in Western culture today, that's here in America, one of the great struggles is not that we have a diminishing number of people who say they believe in God. We have a diminishing number of people who act like they believe in God. When we trust God, it naturally leads to action. And I don't say that saying, and it's super easy all the time. When God calls us to trust him with our resources and the giving of tithes and all, it's always easy to give 10% when the bills stack. It's always easy to say no to what I had planned for my life. It's always easy to say no to my dream. It's always, I'm not saying that, but when we trust that God is good all the time and all the time that God is, when we trust that, if we truly trust him, then we will act according to the trust. I think we can look across the landscape of our country here and we think, man, things are terrible and uh, the church is losing ground. And here's the reality that largely in America, the church is losing ground. Now, praise God that what I said earlier about people getting saved and baptized, that's evidence of revival here, amen? But we have to take the blinders off because while, yes, there are some evidence that we're losing some ground here, remember the church goes beyond the shores of our country. And today in India and Asia, literally thousands of people a week are calling upon the name of Jesus. They're taking their belief and their trust and they're acting upon it. That's why in the New Testament we will read this, faith, trust, belief without works is dead. That's why Paul would say in Ephesians chapter two, many of us know verses eight and nine, for it is by grace through faith that you are saved and not of your own doing, not by your works so that you can't brag about it, right? It's by grace through faith, not your works. You can't take credit for it. But then verse 10 of Ephesians chapter two says, for you, for we are his workmanship. Some versions say craftsmanship. We are his masterpiece. Called to do good works, which he prepared for us before the beginning of time. 
doesn't say that we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, so we can just talk a good game. But that's so we can participate. How do we live a blessed life? We, we continue on in participation. Again, we, we don't view God's direction as suggestion. We participate with him. But now if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 15, I want to go to the last point. What do we see in the life of Abram? We see that God provided a path. He called, he called him. He initiated. He sought Abram out. He said, he, I want you to leave what you know. Go to where I'll show you. In doing so, I have a promise for you. And that is a promise of blessing. And then we see Abram participate with God in belief and action. But how do we continue on, right? When the days get longer, whenever every day doesn't feel like an amazing worship service, whenever the curse seems to really be growing in our viewpoint and the blessing seems to be shrinking, how do we continue on? Well, ultimately, beloved, it is about the posture. That's the final point. The posture with which we live. Genesis chapter 15 says this, after these events. So we are now removed from this initial encounter. Abram has left what he knew. He had some interesting family dynamics with Lot. I mean, it got crazy. But when we get to Genesis 15, he, he's no longer 75. He's pushing 100. And it says this in Genesis 15, verse 1, after these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward, your reward will be very great. I love the next line in verse 2, but Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me? Since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. You know what I love about Abram here is he's, he's just, he is casting his burden to the Lord. That's what we're called to, cast your cares upon me. Years before, God spoke to Abram, hey, I am the one true God. Leave what you know. Go to what is unfamiliar. Follow my voice. Trust me, I will bless you. I will make you into a great nation. That's got to begin with an heir, right? I'm going to make this happen. And Abram says, yes, I'm going to go. You are the one true God. I believe that. He leaves. He packs up. He goes through some ups and downs. And here in this moment, some decades later, he says, God, God shows up and says, hey, remember, I'm your shield, right? When Abram is not sure about what he sees, God reminds him of who he is. You catch that? God being sovereign, knowing Abram's struggle, the first thing he says to him is, remember, I'm your shield. And Abram says, Lord, <laughs> I'm kind of struggling here. Because, oh, Eleazar, my servant's son, I, it, it appears he's going to be my heir. What, what can you give me? Abram has laid it out on the line. In verse 4, now the word of the Lord came to him and said, get over it. The word of the Lord came to him and said, how dare you? No, God's loving kindness. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them. I am, by the way. That would be God. And then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Now listen to me. In these first five verses of Genesis 15, Abram, who had taken the path God had called him to, God had revealed the promise. Abram was participating with the Lord. And there's this critical moment where Abram seems to see the curse as bigger than the blessing. He is seeing the brokenness of his wife's 
barren womb. He is seeing a, a, a servant's child as his likely heir. And he doesn't just bottle it up. He, he says, Lord, this is what I am seeing. It seems like brokenness has won yet again. And then God in gracious loving kindness says, no, sir. Eleazar, great guy. I like him, but he is not going to be your heir. Someone from your own body says, you and your wife will indeed have a son. In fact, Abram, I want to show you something. Here, come with me. Look up in the sky. Count the stars. One, two. Okay, stop. You can't. You're going to waste too much time. I got something to say. (laughs) Count the stars if you can. And then the Lord says this, your offspring, your descendants, the fruit of my promise will be as numerous as as the stars. So the stage has been set, right? Abram has confessed to the Lord that he is struggling and he, it seems the curse is blocking his vision. And God in gracious loving kindness says, no sir, remember what I have told you. So, so, so Abram is seeing something and God didn't say, well, surprise, have Sarah take a pregnancy test. Gotcha, she's pregnant already. He he did not provide right there in this critical moment this tangible, visible evidence that that Abram could latch onto in that moment when Abram said what he was feeling and seeing, God responded with his word. And then in verse six, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram didn't wait for Isaac to trust God. Abraham saw Isaac because he trusted God. The posture of his heart, Abram was not a perfect man, but the posture of his heart, the posture of his heart trusted the voice of God when his sight showed him something else. In this broken world, beloved, sometimes we will feel more of a curse than a blessing And we'll have to decide, will will it be what we see with our physical eyes or what we see with our spiritual eyes? Will we believe that those promises of God that we just sang about are indeed faithful and true? You say, well, yeah, but, you know, man, Chris, I've just got such a messed up life. And even, even though I've said yes to Jesus, I just, lately, I've, man, I've been just kind of seeking my own thing and I, I just... The amazing thing, yes, God calls us to participation. Don't miss this. As a Christ follower, your obedience to him keeps you walking in the joy of salvation. Your obedience to him keeps you on the path. Because of his grace, he allows us to get off. You can't ever get out of his grip, but you can get off the path. But understand this, that if you're following Jesus today, the only reason you got on the path is because he called you to himself. You respond, if you were to look, you don't have to turn. If you look at the book of Hebrews, we read about Abel. Some of y'all remember we talked about him a few, few weeks ago. If you missed that, Adam and Eve, right? First parents, they had some sons, Cain and Abel. And it says in Genesis that God regarded Abel's offering, right? They, they both brothers, Abel and Cain, worshiped. They offered, and it says that God regarded Abel's offering. Now, we, we can... I could re-preach that sermon, but I don't have time for it. So let me just get to this point. What Hebrews tells us is that the reason why God regarded Abel's offering was because Abel did so by faith. By faith, Abel trusted God. We also read about a guy named Enoch. It says that he walked with God and was not. Man, that is a testimony right there. Enoch walked with God and was not. He was taken up. Oh, we should be knots for God, right? But that word walked literally carries the idea of trusted intimacy. It wasn't just that he was, it was that he trusted God and in doing so, God took him. Bible tells us that Noah, we looked, looked at him last week briefly, Noah walked with God. 
You know, I made, I made a comment last week as we were talking about the corruption that has spread across the globe when we see what's happening in the, in the Old Testament. And I said, I believe that Noah was as corrupt as anybody. And what I mean is that when, when Noah was born, he wasn't born without, without sin. He was born just as broken as every person on the planet was. But God spoke to Noah, that's grace. God spoke to Noah just like he spoke to Abram. And when God spoke, Noah responded. That's why the Bible would say then that that he was righteous and blameless. Because he was born that way? No, because God called him and he responded. God said, Noah, I want you to do this. What did Noah do? He did it. He participated, right? Hebrews says that Noah walked with God. Hebrews talks about Abraham, who again, he believed by faith. And as we read here, it was credited to him as righteousness. You say, well, well, how did that work out? Let's, let's get to today, Chris. How, how did that work out? Well, I think it worked out okay. Because today there are still people from the lineage of Abraham, Jewish people, the people of Israel that are seeking Jesus. I guess that's a fulfillment of a promise. And then while I don't know for sure in this room in overflow, maybe, maybe watching online, there may be someone of Jewish descent, but most likely the vast majority of us would fall into what the Bible calls a Gentile background. But while I know today the, 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 the promise of that nation specifically that, that, would, be, that would, would be raised up, while today there are still people that are seeking God from that lineage, I look across a room today of people of all kinds of backgrounds. And what it looks like to me, it looks to me that there was a nation that was raised up who the king of kings would come from so that today it sure does look to me that all the nations have indeed been blessed. I would say that it worked out pretty well and that God kept his end of the deal, amen? So the question is what does it mean for us? You say, Chris, I'm going through it right now. Marriage is falling apart. My kids are prodigals. I made a mess of my finances. I'm unemployed. Hey, I've got this diagnosis. I've got all these, the, the curse is reigning in my life, Chris. How, how does this apply to me? Well, beloved, my question is, what will you choose to be your posture towards God? Because I still wish that I could find the chapter and verse that says, when you trust Jesus, every day is a Friday. Roses and rainbows. Unicorns in the backyard. But I haven't found it yet. Much like Abram, Abraham had to trust God that the fulfillment of what God had spoken to him wouldn't be actually seen with his physical eyes. Just like he had to wait to the day that Isaac was born. Just like David, the great king, had to wait from the day that Samuel anointed him as the king of Israel before the day that he sat on the throne, almost losing his life at the hands of the king on the throne. And it sounds simple, but I recognize it's not, but it comes down to this reality. What will be the posture of our hearts towards God? Will we make decisions in our lives based only on what we see or will we make decisions based on what he says? And this is my promise to you, that if you will trust his hand, even when you can't see it, if you will trust his heart, even when you can't see what's, what, what, what's making sense, if you will trust him, even when you can't see it, I promise you the day will come where your eyes will see clearly, where your faith becomes sight. But what will we do in the moment? If we let the curse reign in our hearts, we project the curse and we don't show people what Jesus has done for us. But if on those difficult days and on the great ones, we continue to believe the path he's called us to is connected to the promise that he has for us, which is his presence, his glory, and our good, and we participate with him then we will find the posture of our hearts being one of trust, even when what we see doesn't make sense. We stay connected, as Jesus says in John 15, 
I'm the vine and you're the branches. Stay connected to me. And so as we get ready to have a time of worship, just a few things I want to ask you. Are there some things in your life today that cause the curse seemingly to be magnified? Maybe today, we talk about this all the time, you just need to take a moment of gratitude to remind yourself of the blessing that you have. Maybe you need to ask yourself if you're walking the path that you know God's called you to. Maybe for some of us today, we, we know we have trusted Jesus. We, we, we remember the exact day. We know it was in eighth grade. We, we, we have the, the, the time frame, but, but at some point in time, you know you've trusted Jesus. Well, then my question is, are you participating with him today? I think some of us, there is a very clear action step that he's calling you to take. It's higher commitment to the church. Maybe it's something in your personal life. We're, we're going to have, I think, one or two baptisms in just a moment, maybe today. L- listen, I know this can be a sensitive subject, particularly in our culture. Maybe some of us today, we've trusted Jesus, but we have not yet been baptized. I want to be abundantly clear. I've got to wrap this up. Baptism can never save you. You can get dunked as an adult, sprinkled as an infant, anything in between. It cannot provide salvation. It should be a demonstration of salvation. Not being baptized doesn't remove your salvation. You know, I talk to people sometimes and I'll say, hey, do you know Jesus? They'll say, oh yeah. I'll say, well, when did you trust him? And sometimes people say, well, I've been a Christian my whole life. That immediately triggers my mind to think they don't know Jesus. I need to present the gospel because no one is a Christian their whole life. And maybe for some of us today, you, you know you have given your life to Jesus. But, but, but maybe as, a, as an infant, your, 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 your parents, your family, grandparents had you baptized in the church. And, and listen, I'm not coming for that today. We don't do that. We dedicate children to the Lord as we'll do next week. But, but I'm not here to come against that. What I'm here to say is that when, when we read the Bible here at BT, we believe the Bible calls us to surrender our lives to Jesus. That gets us on the path. And then we believe oh, baptism is an act of obedience. That gets us participating with them. And maybe for some of us, I'm just going to say it, maybe for some of us, our hesitation to be baptized is because we feel we would be maybe dishonoring the family we grew up in. But remember this, when he calls us to something, he's calling us away from something. Maybe for some today, maybe it's here in just a few moments, maybe you want to come back tonight for the fiesta and get baptized in the pool, but maybe you need to start participating and maybe baptism's away. Maybe, again, it's higher involvement in, in the church. Maybe it's getting more vocal in school or the workplace. I don't know, it could be a million things. But ask yourself this, do you know that you've been blessed and can you point to how you are being a blessing? Maybe someone, though, today, when it comes to certainty about knowing your relationship with God through his son, Jesus, you don't know for sure that that's something that you have. You don't, you don't know that you have given your life to Jesus and received his gift of salvation. Here's the great news. Just like God called Abram, he's calling you today. And I believe just like Abram had the opportunity to respond, so do you today. And so as we get ready to worship, if today your response is to give your life to Christ, I'm gonna invite you where you are just to say this prayer with me. I'm gonna ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Again, if you wanna give your life to Jesus today, get on the path that he has for you. I'm gonna ask you to say this prayer with me. I say every week the prayer is not a magic formula because there's no such thing. The prayer is simply a confession that you believe that Jesus is the savior that you need. So if that's your decision, where you are, just pray this with me. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know I need a savior. I believe that Jesus is the savior that I need. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe that Jesus rose three days later in victory. And today, Jesus, I trust you with my life. 
and I receive the gift of salvation. 